ladies and gentlemen, mm, I think we should start. Uh, welcome to the University of Warsaw. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our panel, which is the third in this conference, Nation Building Processes in Eastern Europe after 2020, the Postcolonial Dimension. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Anna Novikov. Well, well I've expected Purnia Poadismiente. So please do it mm, with the introduction of next panelist, uh, Dr. Ivana Kaliszewska. <laughs> Slight better. And, and Anton Saifuayev. <laughs> and last but not least, Mikola Ryabchuk, who, <laughs> good, who is virtually present behind me. Well, we shall start, I think I propose modestly, to limit uh, your, uh, your papers or voices in discussion to 20 minutes in order to get time, to give a time, sorry, for our respectable uh, listeners, viewers. Uh, so, Anna Novikov from Greifswald Universität We'll start with the uh, reflection on Russia 2000-2022, the development of military propaganda through mass uh, culture. The theme in our contemporary uh, situation is uh, really relevant. So please, floor is yours. But um, I would like to start my presentation first from the introduction of the whole project because actually it's a part of the book which I'm writing right now um, and where I'm focusing on uh, several, um, I would say, uh, post-Soviet countries uh, or post-Eastern Bloc countries and the development of patriotic performance and close there actually as a part of a general um, trend in the, 20, uh, in the uh, last 20 years um, when we see a, actually a very interesting phenomenon of this uh, reinvention of uh, self, I would say national self-branding through various post-colonial, I regard it as actually post-colonial practices, by the way, it's not only in the Eastern, former Eastern Bloc or post-Soviet areas, there are also some other post-colonial post -colonial, uh, areas as well where this phenomenon is occurring right now in the last 20 years when um, there is an attempt to reinvent um, visual practices or performance which, performative practices which were existing already in the 19th century during the, like, you know, the development of nationalism. So we have here a sort of return to like, imperial or colonial practices which in the case of Russia also merged very much and now very strongly with um, with their return to Soviet practices, which again I regard actually like as a post-imperial uh, phenomenon. But now actually I, in this talk I would like to, um, to focus on Russia and to reflect on the development of um, military, like you know, not only military, but patriotic and military dress, which in the end brought to what's going in Russia right now. And I see it actually as a process of mobilization like visual mobilization of, uh, through visual propaganda, we were discussing it already yesterday, you know, the information uh, war, and here I see that actually is a part of mobilization and information war. So I'll start actually from the end. Then from the end of February 22, Russian forces, as we know, started to be visualized by the mysterious letter Z, appearing on military vehicles close to the Ukrainian border. And this letter token taken from the Roman alphabet appeared with two other letters, sometimes V and O. Soon after the beginning of the war, Z migrated by promotion from above and with support from below from Russian tanks to Russian clothes, car stickers, logos and graffitis, becoming a populist Russian symbol promoting the war in Ukraine. 
Then multiple media and experts from all over the world and Russia itself tried to decrypt the meaning of the symbol and the reason is appeared in Latin and not Cyrillic alphabet. And then, as you might uh, all very well remember, especially in the first weeks, there were various theories brought up, starting from Zora and Zelensky, like trying to actually to, to, to decrypt this Z, coming to compare it to swastika sign and the Russified version of nationalist uh, socialists like Zikhail, Zik in Russian transcription, and ending up with the first role of, of, uh, word of Russian slogans za or for za pobedu, for victory, za Rasil, for Russia, uh, Zappa, the West, Zimla, uh, etc., etc. And the press office of the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, support the latest version, uh, Zapabedu, when on the March uh, thir on 3rd of March it started at Zetman Zapabedu, and we was a part of the slogan Sila of Pravde, in truth is strength. That um, Sila of Pravde it said, itself is an aphorism taken from uh, the Russian cult movie Brother 2. Bradva from 2000 as a statement of the main protagonist. It followed by a saying that God uh, is not in mice but in truth belonging to a legendary medieval Russian prince, commander and saint Alexander Nevsky, who, and that's important, so you will understand later on why, won the battle with German Teutonic Knights. And uh, later on, it was also repeated by no less legendary commander Alexander Sovolov. And when we're speaking about the movie itself, the Brother 2, it relates to the Brotherhood and depicts actually in one of the scenes or more scenes the fight between the Russian and Ukrainians. And nowadays it's became one of the symbols of the war and been screened in some Russian cinemas again. However, the real meaning of the symbol is not entirely clear. And uh, I was following the media and actually came across various theories when it was speaking, uh, actually uh, discussed that already before the beginning of the war, the week before it, on some telegram Russian patriotic uh, channels that were attempts to create a symbol of, uh, like you know, of um, Russian victory with a sort of handmade uh, uh, letter Z made very like randomly on a white color, and uh, then it was adopted by the Russian at the beginning of the war by the Russian press office and sort of transformed from up to below to the population. While actually, if you remember that many uh, patriots who were sitting on those telegrams were fascinated with the uh, history of the. Uh, World War II and the Great Patriotic War in uh, Russian terms, we also should remember that there were several symbols where actually uh, several uh, occasions where the letter Z was used. For instance, the force Panzergrenadier Brigade, uh, brigade uh, one of the Wehrmacht uh, brigades, which uh, came from Germany actually to, in the Operation Barbarossa to the northern part of Russia and was fighting very close to the Lake Ladoga and was defeated there. And actually, Lake Ladoga is very close to the Pipus Lake, where we remember that Alexander Nevsky actually defeated the Teutonic Knights. So again, we have here a sort of a hint to the victory of Russia. Then we have some more symbols where that appears, like for instance, the our zero, which actually symbolized the end of the World War II and the denazification of Germany. When, um, if we remember that actually nowadays Russia, like one of the propaganda tools of Russia already from the being, uh, beginning, was to compare Ukraine to the National so Socialist Germany and sort of denazificate Ukraine. So we'll go and see how the whole message is all the time, uh, it's constantly following actually the Russian propaganda. But anyway, whatever it means, by the way, also there was a trend, it's not the first time that um, this Latin alphabet letters, or by the way, also Russian alphabet letters in uh, Latin, uh, like Latin letter context are appearing on the T-shirt. There was already like some years when it was sort of a trend to play with all the symbols, so it was something actually that it was already uh, like within the trend. But what's actually interesting, that uh, it started to appear, uh, as, as we all know, very soon in pa Russian patriotic flash mob. Uh, Plopsh mobs promoting the state propaganda and unifying its uh, nationalist supporters. So within a few days, such patriotic fashion performance became really viral on social media and off-site and uh, in various corners of Russia. So um, the famous example, of course, there are the letter Z appearing on the clothes of Russian gymnast Ivan Kulak in the World Cup competition in Qatar, or Maria Butina, the parliamentarian and foreign agent, appeared in public with this letter on her T-shirt. We uh, uh, saw the letter Z appearing on the banners of cities and metro stations. And also we had some... Um, like sort of uh, flash mobs where students in Omsk were holding banners with that, or the iconic ballet piece One Lake in Donetsk was also shaping itself in the letter Z. But um, actually, it's not the first time that a Russian state supports fashion performance as tools of propaganda. 
or as I say again, it's actually tools of also mobilization. And visual messages to audience, as we all know, are essential in every ideology. And connection between Atar, nationalisms and politics is far from uh, being new. And if we are speaking about uh, clauses um, that actually it started to have political meaning in Russia already from the early modern age onwards. When I'm speaking about the reign of Tsar Peter the Great, when traditional Russian dress was abandoned by the elite, by the laws of the Tsar, to resemble European dress codes, and then later on we had all the time up and down of Russia tre uh, Russian dress appearing very often within the actually um, and dress elements of the elite. Uh, uh, we are speaking also about the ruling family, which in the, for instance, 1903 again created sort of a masquerade in Russian costumes. But uh, what's interesting now, so again, we have uh, now, um, after two and a half decades, so to say, of uh, post-Soviet time, of, uh, when it was a turn to Western fashion, we have a return to the Russian patriotic dress once. Again, I will see it uh, in a second. And uh, during the two last decades, actually, Russian nationalist actors, designers, apparel, uh, store owners, politicians, artists promote in social media the so-called traditional old Russian costumes for uh, Russian uh, patriots. And um, what I would like to show you now, it's actually some trends of patriotic dress in Russia and how it's all bring in the end to sort of this, uh, or prepares the ground to this uh, military visual promotion or military visual propaganda and mobilization. So we have several directions. And I hope it works. So first of all, uh, one of the most, uh, oh yeah, it's good. Uh, fashionable brands, which actually was compared to fashion trends, is uh, Putin himself, and we have a huge, uh, already like, it's again, it's already for some time, so uh, the, the Putin is depicted on the various t-shirts in various, um, uh, yeah, in, in various ways, uh, uh, emphasizing, so to say, his military, militant, uh, I would say, toxic masculinity style, where often appeared either in military clothes or in his famous judo kit. We have, by the way, here promotion of also Putin team, um, like activist head of Putin team, uh, Ivan Ovechkin, who um, started to promote also some, uh, um, some pieces of clothes. For instance, in the left side, we see a famous uh, depiction, which is called uh, Putin in Daisies, uh, taken from the collection, uh, actually artistic collection, patriotic collection called The Kindest of People, which uh, aimed to uh, emphasize the human and, so to say, soft sides of the president. Uh, of course, we have here all the famous symbols of... Uh, yeah, again, like uh, Putin uh, discussing, uh, uh, like uh, Putin um, interacting, it was already for some years ago with Obama, etc. Like there are really multiple, uh, there are lots of uh, depictions of Putin. And if we go further, again, we see that in mass media and also like in various parts of Russia, there were attempts to, again, to uh, visualize Putin again as a strong leader, sometimes comparison, compar being compared to, to uh, to the Roman Emperor, by the way, if we are going back, uh, here it's really interesting, we see a comic, uh, Super Putin, which appeared already like uh, almost a decade ago and uh, became also quite famous, which depicted Putin a la Daniel Craig and his judo kid, uh, Saving the World. Um, Putin Fechtier, for instance, is an attempt to create a patriotic brand, which uh, here we have a ring of power, sort of, which play, plays with all the, uh, actually plans to attract young adults and young people to playing with all the hipster names. For instance, Putin Fechtier is also an attempt to somehow to hint to all the Berlin brands and to make it more uh, like uh, acceptable and interesting for younger people. Um, when speaking about admiration of the president, here again, first of all, we see an attempt to merge the hipster culture with Putin. And it's really interesting that uh, Putin has been also um, sort of uh, became a sex symbol and eroticized and sexually appreciated by the female part of his supporters. One, uh, for instance, we are speaking here about the Putin dress here on the left, uh, as you can see here which was a present given to Putin by Mona El-Mansouri, 
the United Emirates designer to his birthday in October um, 2016. And on this dress, as you can see, uh, it depicts Putin with a carob, uh, like uh, with a wings of carob in his famous judo kits, also surrounded by some carobs and holding the globe, so emphasizing his power over the world in his fight for peace. And also unification, sort of creating a unification of uh, uh, Arab and Russian nations. Um, before the elections, the project said, and you can see here, tried to create some other attempt to attract the attention to Putin by uh, depicting him holding the female cleavage, again, emphasizing, sort of eroticizing the, the Russian president and uh, uh, to make him more attractive. Okay, uh, this is uh, one of the latest depiction of uh, the president with a very famous, actually, viral verse which appeared on the media like already a couple of, uh, no, actually, I think a year or two years ago in my dream, I asked God whether Russia has a way. God smiled and replied, I gave you Putin. And we see that now this verse travels through social media in all the possible directions, very often, again, eroticizing the Russian president. And now I'm coming to a very, very interesting uh, direction when we are speaking about the revival of Russian patriotic, or let's say a real Russian, old Russian dress. And here I brought you some examples from the house of Russian apparel, which uh, now becomes bigger and bigger. Actually, I'm following the development of the house already for uh, five, six years, and they're just sort of becoming quite an empire nowadays, especially among the elite. And it was established in 2011 by Valentina Averyanova. Uh, and it's offered the customers real Russian clothes, shoes and accents, uh, accessories which we combine, false motif, as you can see, with the latest Western fashion trends. And this house promotes Russian tradition in the history of fashion. This is how they call it. And what is interesting here, it demonstrates a very close support to the Russian Orthodox Church and vice versa, because they're also appearing in many blogs of Russian Orthodox Church. They're inviting the um, Russian Orthodox Church and also politician, politicians to lots of the activities, etc. And actually, according to the Archpriest, the revival of Russian states will start when people attend the church in their national clothes because nowadays there are also discussions how actually the proper Russian Orthodox women should appear in the church, what they should dress, how they should cover the hair, should they become like old-fashioned, or they should somehow combine also their role in society, like etc. So nowadays there are many discussions about it. And Avriana call actually her mission the revival of the motherland's uh, greatness. And it sounds all very nice and innocent, the return of real Russian clothes. She is working actually with real details, trying to go to the folks costume and elite costumes to try to uh, really to elaborate them in a very aesthetic way. But actually it st stops to be innocent when we uh, following the connection which was named Revival and it was dedicated to the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014. And uh, by the way, here you see um, on these pictures um, the family of Averyanovo herself. I'm just trying to get it. Well, I think the battery is just about to die, so I'll prefer not to use it too much. But if you see on the lower corner the family uh, dressed in rich, uh, actually a no Russian nobility dress, so it's Averyanova herself, her daughter Anastasia, which currently she is a quite an influencer and a blogger, and she promotes, and actually she also becomes a model, as you can see here on uh, several uh, depictions, uh, also emphasizing on the one hand really like sort of a strength, at the same time femininity, beauty, so she also, uh, she playing on really many motifs here. She was her husband, her daughter, and uh, as I told Valentina Averyanova, her mother, and they have one more sister who is now working on creating a, a chain of Russian patriotic schools which are supposed to substitute the sort of Western schools and their calling in public where actually often the Russian elite or Russian oligarchs to take the children out from London and bring back to Russia into real Russian patriotic schools. Um, yeah, and they're actually calling to dress, yeah. <laughs> Is it better now? Yeah, yeah let's try. Uh, as I told the Colin to wear this clothes not only in the church, not only during the wedding, but also on the nowadays. And what actually becomes even less innocent when we see with whom she is um, 
collaborating. She's collaborating with Irina um, Volskaya, who has a very elite and rich um, real estate agency, which called Slavyansky Dvor or Slavic Yard, who herself is, loves to be a model, a model in the dresses of, uh, as I told, of Averyanova. And she invested really lots of money into patriotic banners. Uh, which you can find across Russia. Really, I'm speaking about hundreds and thousands of banners, which were uh, slogans, for instance, uh, God, please tell, uh, give the victory to Russia and president. We have here again the letter Z appearing in this, uh, in this call, or for instance, which is even uh, more scary, the future of the earth is shaped by the moral and atomic energy of Russia. So sort of uh, hinting to the biggest scare of the West nowadays. And again, she's very active. And uh, what is very interesting is that all the women, it's actually they're trying to create a huge female network which is support, uh, tries to support the military, um, I would say, successes or uh, really military um, moods in Russia nowadays because <clears throat> they believe in power of women, especially elite women. And they really, I, I'm, I'm going through the blogs and nowadays they're very active in it. They're writing that uh, the wives are sort of uh, the neck of the husbands and actually the wives are bringing the husbands to think in a certain way and even speak about the Russian elite. So we are, uh, see actually that they have quite an influence. By the way, it reminds me um, uh, um, the Handman's to uh, Tale, uh, like you know, the, the book and the movie and the role of the wives there. I don't know how it's actually connected, but I think they're also taking some hints from there. But if we are going back to the beginning of 2010, we speak about the international Eurasian youth movement, and if you hear, you see here actually down the symbol of it, the errors and the figure. And this youth uh, movement is uh, like spiritually supported and also like physically supported by Alexander Dugin, who in the, on his turn actually was one of the, I would say, spiritual influencer, like ideological influencer of Putin himself. And when at the beginning they were seen sort of as emergence, I would say sometimes Maverick now actually some of the ideas we can see in reality. And then, actually, 10 years ago, I saw the slogan, we will take everything back, again, with a female figure in a sort of Russian, uh, very traditional headgear, Pasatsky Platok, uh, holding a gun, a rifle. And then it wasn't really entirely clear what does it mean. And later on, I came actually to the idea that it was a hint to Ukraine, and already then they trying, were trying to promote like this idea of taking back the real, like sort of Russian uh, lens, etc. Um, I'm not sure that it's, yeah. Okay, so if we are again speaking about the activities of uh, the House of Russian Apparel, so this is from the recent collections appeared, uh, I think, a month and something ago, a green brush with water, uh, white letter Z and the earrings with the letter Z and V. Um, now we are coming to, if we are already speaking about the military mood, uh, we should uh, go into two directions. First of all, the development of the um, 9th of May, the Victory Day, um, um, I would say fashion in Russian, it was called a couple of years ago, Pabeda Besia, the, like, you know, the Friends of Demons. And uh, when in the anniversary of... Uh, 75 years of the great victory, uh, like huge parade were done in public, but there actually we are going even back to the 2005 when, as you can see, the Sarge George Ribbons, which have a long dis actually history and first appeared as a military sort of a symbol of um, Mm, uh, Brother Ekaterin the Great, like a symbol of uh, special military distinguishedness. Later on, we're again brought back to the Soviet army when we're speaking about the victory of the, the like, you know, of the Nazi Germany. And in the 2005, in a huge uh, project or movement, just movements, several movements together, which were called actually to depict the memories and to like to bring the memories of the victory days, it was again brought back to public, emphasizing two colors, the orange and the black. Sometimes they are compared to flame and to the, like, you know, to, to the smoke. And brought in public, given to people, and they became sort of symbol of Russian victory on, like, you know, over the Nazi Germany. While nowadays it's very often we can see again the letter Z shaped actually in the uh, colored in the colors of the ribbon. Again, 
9th of May, we remember, we are proud, thank you, Grandpa, for victory, etc. That are the slogans which started to be brought already for 2005, and especially they became dominant two years ago. And by the way, that's very interesting, because as you remember, 2000 ago, uh, two years ago, we all were sitting in a lockdown in COVID, and then I was following the patriotic face mask during the uh, COVID uh, period time, not only, by the way, in Russia. It was also a very interesting phenomenon in Poland too, but then exactly the lockdown, or like, you know, the whole parades were combined with uh, these patriotic mas masks in Russia. And lots of web stores, uh, by the way, when I'm speaking about patriotic clothes, it's not only one example of the cows of Russian apparel, I'm speaking about really lots, uh, like huge amount of stores I'm working with. I just here bring you little pieces of a huge sea of, like, you know, of uh, apparel which appears right now in Russia. So as you can see, patriotic masks were produced with lots of, uh, again, slogans and symbols of uh, military orders. Thank you, Grandpa, for victory. This is our victory, etc. And of course, we see here an attempt to create patriotic masks with uh, Putin himself, believing in a it's all the ordinary uh, theories that, uh, according to sympathetic magic, his likeness on the face will protect the wearer from COVID. It's, but it's a semi joke from my side. Um, okay, and at the same time, already two years, but I was following this development of bringing the children into military fashion. It's not a new, actually, nowadays it's became really massive, but it started to appear already several years ago when we started to see first attempts, like as we see here. Uh, especially on the upper pictures, children being depicted in retro military clothes. It's also very interesting that they are going back to the Soviet style clothes from the 40s, being depicted on calendars, on uh, several titles, also fashion to really to make photos of children in this old 40s style, black and white, or a bit greenish black um, and greenish white uh, photos. And by the way, this cute kiddo there down uh, with a rifle. This is one of the members of the Eurasian youth, which I think was depicted like uh, 10 years ago when they were making uh, youth camps, uh, trying to fight. And when they're thinking that now he can be 17, 18 years old, so this is a generation which grew up on certain, um, like, you know, some motives. Um, already two years ago, I started to follow mass parades, which you can see here on the corner, where many mothers were bringing and carrying their children, first of all, uh, dressed in military clothes, the children sitting in tanks, also, also babies like dressed in the uh, 40s style uh, military clothes. Uh, uh, these parades were really massive. But actually, what is very interesting, this is the photos from this uh, 9th of May, which I was following, when this year it became really, really massive in, I'm speaking about like thousands and dozens of thousands of photos of children. Uh, lots of projects where children are depicted like marching. You can see also the St. George ribbons. Uh, more and more children starting to uh, use like to care real weapons and be also depicting this as weapons. Actually, it's very interesting that also the female, like the girl's role is uh, warriors and fighters is emphasized. It's not, by the way, only Russian phenomenon in the last years. It's uh, more and more motives of fighting females are appearing in several, like, you know, in several countries. And here, actually, uh, what's interesting that especially among the kindergartens, this fashion of a military parade this year became really, really fashionable. And here I would like to please to ask you to show a short video, just one of a really huge amount of videos of these parades which were uh, created in, I think, in lots of kindergartens in Russia. So this is also one of the kindergartens where children, like starting from the smallest ages and then older ages, for instance, here, the border uh, army is marching right now. Please notice the St. George ribbons on the children's clothes and also the letters Z, which appear quite often. Thank you. And if you could notice also the verses, which are the quoting actually that are older Soviet verses, uh, this is very uh, interesting that nowadays it's again the memory of the great victory days, which is combined with the war, with, like in Ukraine, 
and again hinting all the time to you know, like sort of Ukraine as uh, comparing to nationalist socialist Germany, as we see also this Soviet costumes are combined with letters Z, and uh, very often they're combined with also Soviet songs. And here I just bring you some pictures I made on the um, parades of the 9th of May in Berlin in the Treptow Park, where you have like the famous Soviet war memorial. And while actually wearing in public Russian slogans uh, and banners, it was forbidden, as you can see here from the announcements of Berlin police, people came then instead of with, with Soviet clothes, sort of anyway bring Russia there. So you can see Soviet flags, Soviet uh, symbols, and also if you see here the demonstration close to Brandenburg Gate, also Soviet, uh, I would say, um, performative symbols, like also always on the 9th of May parade during Soviet times, the balloons were brought and uh, uh, some flowers, etc. So all these real, lots of Soviet symbols were present because they were not entirely Russian, so they could put it in public. And uh, latest developments, it's again an attempt to create, like we know that uh, this year on the 19th of May, that was a huge attempt to create, celebrate, to accept the children into the pioneer organizations. We are speaking about thousands of such actions in different uh, cities and towns in the whole Russia, not only by the way in Russia, also outside, um, really following the visual, like you know, symbols of the Soviet uh, pioneer parades. And here in the center, I put it, actually a picture of uh, Yun Armia, this is the like the army of the youth, which nowadays becomes more and more popular, sort of um, also try, uh, attempt to create Russian scout organization, which also they are actually emphasizing the importance of military education of young children. And if we are already speaking about the military symbols, uh, and this is, I think... Yes, this is the last, uh, the last depiction, which for me is actually a Christian session of everything. We're speaking about the Church of the Russian Armed Forces, which was created close to Moscow district two years ago, commemorating the, like, you know, the anniversary of the great victory, made in a sort of military colors, with very, uni I think, unique and specific um, design inside where we have lots of depictions of uh, Jesus Christ with a sword, lots of, again, lots of signs and warriors, again, depicted with swords, uh, emphasizing the military character. Even here down, you can see the, like, the Lady Mary herself holding Jesus Christ in, um, sort of, in, in a movement which resembles us, actually, the famous Soviet poster, Rodina Madzaviot, or like the motherland is calling you for war. And this depiction in the middle, um, which is now also becomes quite viral and calls Jesus Christ uh, won the hell and Russia will win too. This is for me a quintessential of everything because we see here a uh, sort of work together of uh, visual symbols like this soldier who is carrying Z, it stays together with Jesus Christ, of religion, of clothes, and actually of all the I would say, nowadays, uh, military fashion. Thank you very much. I say it. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure that you will have many questions or comments, so please prepare them. And now I give the floor to Ivana Kalishevska, doctor from Warsaw University who will tell us about North Caucasus perspective, so a totally different view with Kinjaus and Lesginka, war dance. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, first, I want to thank you for this beautiful presentation. Mine will not be so beautiful and it will be way less humble. Well, I'm an anthropologist, just you know, to let you know so that my perspective is very different because I try to talk to people and kind of try to get the bottom-up perspective. So what you will get now, I'll try to present you. So my goal is kind of humble because the war has been going on for just over like 100 days. So, and I have not been in the North Caucasus for a year now. So my film material comes from uh, WhatsApp conversation with my with my friends um, who are who are living there. So basically, my talk I'll talk about uh, how the war is seen and perceived uh, from the North Caucasus, in particular from Dagestan. I'll focus on this republic since this is the republic that I have been researching for the last 18 years. So obviously, I have a broad network of people that I can still 
talk to now who can provide me with, uh, with their insights about, uh, about the war. Uh, so, yeah, so my presentation is based on this kind of film material, but it's not, it's too early to theorize, so I'm basically pre pre presenting my, my initial findings that are due, uh, due, uh, due to change. So methodology, methodology was as follows, I was just calling my colleagues and my friends from different social groups. I was trying to address both people in the city as well as people uh, in the villages to get their perspective on what is happening in Ukraine and how they are, uh, how they are perceiving it. I was also wondering, I was trying to find out why, despite so many Dagestanis dying in the war and the military, why there is like so, why so little is going on? Why, why there is no upheaval? Why, why, why people would not go to the streets? Or why actually nothing is uh, happening there in the public, uh, in the public sphere? So, for those of you who may not know much about Dagestan, just a brief um, introduction: It's a republic in the north. Uh, Caucasus with around 3 million people, so it's about the size of Georgia and about the population is also about, about that of Georgia, just to give you the brief idea, located at the Caspian Sea. Uh, and it's been quite a turbulent republic until the, well to put it briefly, until the attention of, um, of Russian government turned to, turned to Ukraine, so basically under, un, until 2014, uh, it's been a republic with constant uh, fight with the so-called terrorism, uh, with uh, different turbulent political and social uh, and social well t turbulences. So, uh, in a way, after invasion of the Crimea, of course, it's way more, more complicated than that. But in a way, life became aware more peaceful in the republic. So uh, the, the terrorism ceased, you know, the military left for the Ukraine, so there is no more terrorism, so who produced that? But, but anyway, well, they kind of freed the businesses, so people, people started uh, actually earning more money. So instead of, well, the sanctions, of course, they didn't work after 14 night, or they work now, but uh, so you could see from 2014-15 that the economy of Dagestan was, was on the rise. You could see like people are, are, people are getting richer and richer, although it's claimed to be the second poorest republic, but it's entirely not true. It's just the second economy is flourishing there. So just to give an, you an idea what, it, what, the republic, what the republic looks like, it's predominantly Muslim republic. Uh, and uh, Islam was on the rise, at least in the recent like 15, uh, 15 years. Uh, okay, so I was trying to ask myself this question: Why, you know, why people are not um, protesting, or why they would not do anything about what is what is happening? And my idea is that it's not about fear, as we we, we could assume. Okay, people are afraid, like they are afraid to post on Facebook. No, it's not about fear. And neither it is so much about propaganda. So these two notions that are usually considered the main notions why people would not go to the streets or why they would do nothing are actually not that important. That does not seem to be that important uh, in, uh, in Dagestan, which was surprising to me, but it, it may not be true. I can still continue with this kind of small research. Um, Okay, so my first, uh, so I was trying to address people who may have their nephews or sons in the, in the military, so uh, people who, who are genuinely interested in what might be happening, as well as other people who obviously know people who are in the military, because this is the very much of a clan society, so if your second or third or fourth cousin is in the military, of course everybody, uh, everybody uh, knows it. Uh, so the thing that was spiking a lot of, um, well, not really upheaval, but kind of, um, well, unrest was the fact that uh, right from the beginning of the war, uh, there were dead people, dead Dagestanis, and there were, in numbers, there were more, if you compare the number of the Republic to, you know, Russians from Moscow, for example. So everybody was getting this perspective, like why our boys are dying and this events from Moscow are not. So you, ha you had this feeling of being cheated or being put into something that is actually not your, uh, not your uh, war. So the stories were 
all around. There was a story about the imam in Rostov who would, who would wash six to eight bodies a day and then wrap them up because if they were too destroyed to be shown to the family, they would just wrap them up and send them and send them to the family family in uh, in uh, in Dagestan. But of course, you know, this information was uh, was kind of spread all over. Everybody knew that there are many people uh, people dying. So I was expecting at least some kind of uh, commotion about it, some kind of uh, unrest that this this would cause, because there was there was a lot of talk about that on the social media. People were uh, people were speaking quite frankly on the social media. There's a huge difference with Russia proper in Dagestan, that uh, that people are just put everything out there. I'll try to explain why that might be the case. So social media does not do not seem to be as restricted as we would claim them to be. Everybody has a VPN, even in the small villages. Everybody has Facebook or Instagram and everything is just there. I can access it as easily as I used to access it before, uh, before, uh, before the war. Uh, so the biggest sort of unrest came from the bigger, big number of load 2000 as the dead, body is, uh, the dead bodies are called. Uh, it's hard to estimate the number, it's between 200 and 400 all the estimates, but even myself I know three people that died. It's not that I know them very well, they're usually kids or nephews or the people I know, but if even myself I know people who died from Dagestan who died in the war in Ukraine, that the numbers must be uh, kind, of, uh, kind of huge. Uh, okay, so why they are actually taking it in so peacefully? It's not because they are patriotic, no. You know, all this propaganda that you were showing, well, it, it was there in Dagestan, but they were kind of saying, okay, you know, this big Russianess, we don't want that, why they're running here with this Georgievska Lentichka? Well, this San George band. So they, had the, they were distanced from that f of, of quite a bit. So it was nothing compared to what was happening uh, in Russia. Even now, people in Dagestan would not put the disease. A friend of mine who works in some ministry there, he, she told me, well, our boss just put some disease, but then she went to the bathroom and we just took off all the disease. So there are, the only disease that appear in the public space are disease that are there on the big posters, like billboards, because you can do nothing about that. But people would not put the stickers on their bumpers. They would not, they would not, not do anything like we know people in Russia proper, proper do. So the perception of propaganda in Dagestan is way different than it is in, um, in Russia proper. But the problem is, why would Dagestanis accept the death, such a big death toll so easily? So one of the ideas is that death is a sort of part of the life, part of life, like, um, uh, like shootings and bomb blowings were the part of the life in Dagestan before in 2009, 2000, 2012. So people kind of got, got used to that. Uh, also, the spread of the deaths, it's uneven because sometimes one clan would have half of the boys in the military, whereas another clan would not have the boys in the military at all, because it's, it is sort of a clan society, although, although it's, it's, it is um, simplification. So if my nephew goes, then the nephew of, an, of you know, a brother of a nephew would also go to the military or would do something like that. So, so, so not everybody experiences the death toll uh, in, in, the, in, the same, uh, in the same way. And since this republic has been a pretty violent one, people are used to young people dying because some, someone might have been accused of being a terrorist before, so they would kind of accept it as a fact of life. It's also different in clan society, like perception of death is very different in Russia proper than in the North, uh, and then in the North, um, in the North uh, Caucasus. So, um, so this explains a little bit why they are taking in these deaths so easily. Another fact is that the, uh, the young boys, the young guys who join uh, the military, even if their parents are against it, because it's a very common situation, like parents don't want their sons to go to the war, but the sons were answer, well, I could die anywhere. Look, last week uh, my nephew uh, or my cousin died in a car accident, so you can just die anywhere. So that's why they are taking in as part of uh, their, uh, their life. Another important argument is that fighting is perceived as a job. So 
Um, a friend of mine, her nephew is in the military and he came over for, for a holiday. And I'm asking her, why didn't you stop him from going there? I, I know that she is against the war. And she, she said like, well, he told me, aunt, it's, you know, it's like a job. I go there and, you know, don't take it too personally. I, I'm just taking in it as a job. I may not be into it. So he could as well go to Syria or, or somewhere, some, somewhere else. He, he is treating that and his family like him going and doing his job. So there's nothing about loyalty, nothing about patriotism. Because if I ask, like, what is, the, what is their motivation? Like, why would you go? Like, what's, it's not your war. And it's not even, a, it's, it's also against Islam. So this Islamic factor, factor is also important. But they would say, like, well, it is a job. These are young guys. So if they receive, like, 50,000 rubles a month, it is, quite a, it is quite an amount of money, and they see it this way. And of course, it's not that easy for them to leave because they are saying, oh, we cannot leave my, I cannot leave my comrades, I cannot do this or that. So that's also something that keeps, uh, keeps the boys coming back because they, they went there, then they had the sort of vacation, and then they, uh, and then they came back. That keeps them, uh, that keeps them uh, there because, of course, this income is quite a significant income, and it's also a manly job. This gender factor is also important. Because it is not that they are so poor, because always everywhere I see like, oh, Buryatia and Dagestan are such a poor, poor republics, because you, you look at these numbers and that's just, this is why the people are going. Of course it matters, but there are also people from the so-called good clans going, so they could find another job, but they are still going because for a young boy, before establishing a family, making a certain amount of money is very important. So this money perception is, uh, matters here, here uh, most. Also, about, uh, I was in Dagestan when, uh, when Russia seized the Crimea, and Dagestanis were like, I don't know if they say like, Crimea is ours or not, who cares? But you know, maybe there are job opportunities there. So it was, again, this kind of a look uh, through the perspective of uh, money, not through the perspective that it is our war and we are fighting it because we, because we, be, because we support, uh, we support uh, Putin. So there's a lot that it's not, uh, it's not, it's not, not about that. Another reason why nothing is happening in the Republic is that actually that they are profiting from the war. So the, the, it's not that the economy is on the rise, but of course sanctions, sanctions don't work. They easily go around it. And the second economy has always been flourishing in this, uh, in this republic. They're also pro producing quite a bit. So people do not see any economical disadvantages that come from this war, and which is bad, because I think the only thing that could actually spike Dagestanis to do something is where they are... Uh, they're, um, where the economy goes down and when they actually experience that on themselves that they are getting, uh, getting poorer. Of course, prices went up and things like that happened. It's been a short period that they felt it very, very much. But nowadays, like, like they say, like, no, 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 it's just everything is here. We may have some issue with iPhones, but it only makes them more... Um, it only makes them, it makes them more angry against the West, but not supporting, uh, not supporting, not more supportive, uh, supportive of, uh, of Ukraine. A lot of people would be saying it is not our war and like we want peace. So that's probably the most common, the mo most common opinion about, uh, about the war. And, but the only that are rejecting it totally are the Salafis, the ones that are that used to be called radical or things like that, but for the most time they were, they were usually in opposition. So what the Salafis are saying, this is not our war, but they are saying, okay, we never sent our people to the military or to police, so now we don't have people fighting, but we will also, we, 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 we may not necessarily support people on the Ukrainian side because, you know, it is not our war. We just stay away from that. If we were to help somebody, we would rather help Palestinians. Than, uh, than Ukrainians, so they are staying away, but they're obviously not supporting uh, the government because they have never been supporting the government. They have always been in the uh, in the uh, in the in, in the in the opposition. Uh, okay, so and uh, of course, like everybody was saying, the war has started. Russia will collapse or something like that. But you know, independence claims in this republic has never been very strong. Maybe a little bit in the 90s. 
And it does not look like they are getting anywhere with that. There are just some people voicing that on Facebook, but it does not seem that this is something that is possible, that, that, will, 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 that, will, that will happen, for good or, or for not. Um, so, but now the question why it's not so much about propaganda and fear. So it is not about fear because people in this republic are way less harassed by the FSB and other structures. Uh, why? So a friend of mine ex explained it to me the following. So it's like, look, when somebody in Moscow, some Vanya, uh, would post something or Facebook or speak against, or speak against uh, the war, he gets arrested and nobody cares except for his immediate family. When I say something about the war, like, I mean, like her, her, which I do a lot, and if they arrest me, my whole clan is behind me, and my uncle is also in the military, and my other uncle is in the FSB, so they'll just get me out of there, and there'll be a lot of hustle, there'll be a lot of mess. They don't want that, so they don't, so they basically do not harass people. I have uh, all my Dagestani friends on Facebook, and they would just post anything. They could post, uh, something totally against Putin. They could mock him, they could do this or that, and nothing ever happens to them because they are too much embedded into the clan structures, so the power structures are not uh, so eager to harass people for, uh, for some minor offenses. Even there was this case of a girl, like from 11 class or something like that, that stood up at the final ceremony of school so he would walk out, she would walk up, take the microphone and say like, uh, free, freedom for Ukraine, uh, Putin is a devil or something like that. So he would say, it, she would say it publicly. And the only thing like ha that happened is was that her mother was forced to say in front of TV like, oh, I probably did not bring up my daughter very well. But it, you could very well see that she was forced to do that and nothing else happened and nothing else would. Because if the harassments happened, then people are more likely to go to the streets to defend their people than they are likely to go to the streets because, because, of, because of Ukraine. This thing happen, happened once in 2012 where people went to the streets because too many people were killed and made into terrorists. Like they had this war with terrorism that was basically not a terrorism, just, it was just, you know, they were terrorists just like Ukrainians are fascists, right? And, under, and Dagestanis understand that very well, that this war is not about fascism, that it's not about uh, Banderovce, they don't buy into that propaganda because they have a comparison that, and they would use it, they would say like, sure, Ukrainian is fascist and we are terrorists. We know that kind of, uh, we, we know that kind of mechanics that is behind it. So that's why this uh, propaganda is not taken in as seriously as it is, uh, as it is taken in, in, um, uh, in Russia. And of course, another reason is that, as you also saw um, on Anna's presentation, that this propaganda is very much directed towards the ethnic Russian population. So it, there will be references to history. So here, since Dagestan is a sort of um, colony, you need to put a lot of money in so that it is loyal, because that's how this dynamics works. If money stops flowing from Warsaw, nothing will keep this republic with Russia. So this is only the money, the money, uh, dynamics that is that 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 is there. No loyalty, not much loyalty, or not much, uh, not much of this patriotic upheavals. They were laughing. The last time I've been there was two, was a, exactly a year ago, and they would there was a day of Russia, something like that. I felt, and they would just laugh about all this um, lentichka, well, whatever this um, ribbons, and they would not. Uh, and I could laugh with them, which means I did not disturb their cultural intimacy. If I would laugh with my Russian friends, they would be a bit like, hmm, okay, yeah, stop that. But Dagestanis were just okay with, with, with me mocking this or that or laughing at this clothes. They were not, they were not uh, taking that for themselves because they did not feel that much part of this, uh, of this, of this country. Um, Okay, there is way more, but I'll stop for now. If you have any questions, I'll be eager to, to answer that. So, but the sad conclusion is that it is all about economics and that the, there is a potential of a mobilization of anger, but uh, it's, it can only happen if the economy collapses. In other instances, I do not, do not believe that. Thank you.
Thank you very much. That was a different point of view from social situation a message. <clears throat> However, I think that this liberty expressed in the valleys and the hills of Caucasus was extremely limited for many, many years. That was a freedom in house, in a valley, like in Wales. Mr. Johns from the valley could express his disagreement with King, but not with the crown. That was. So there are limitations in multicultural and multinational Dagestan where every village got its own history <clears throat> of peaceful agreement with mm, Soviet regime. So this is a, a little bitter, but mm, anyway. I'm pleased to announce uh, Dr. Anton Saifuai from Warsaw University as well from Greifswald with his theme, obvious neo-imperialism and belated post-colonialism, a refreshing view of the nation's development processes in the post-Soviet space. Uh, the title is very, very long. I hope that our presentation would be uh, mm, disciplined for we got still one speaker Mikola Ryabchuk. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hubert. Hello, everyone. Uh, my presentation uh, is not a such case studies, uh, and I want to present uh, briefly a very broad methodological approach, which, which is known as uh, post-colonial theory, which related with the post-Soviet <clears throat> post space. Uh, oh, yeah. Academic space has long dealt with the problem of national building in post-Soviet countries in a schematic way of thinking. Every, even early attempts to rethink national building processes within the framework of uh, post-colonial theory were approached uh, from the old patterns of area studies. Mm, and the methodological framework was not rethought but only proposed. As uh, in early attempts uh, to assimilate post-colonial theory to, to the post-Soviet space, uh, like in uh, um, David Moore's uh, text or uh, Eva Thompson's book, uh, Imperial Knowledge, the polar roles of colonizer and colonized have been uh, the old format of ideological post light science, the Cold War. Even with, the, uh, with this format of knowledge, post-Soviet countries were viewed through the perspective of Russian imperialism, that the colonial optics came much later in a very limited uh, circulation. After 2020, uh, the debate had to head, uh, came to, to a head, uh, and the semantics of Russia as a colonizer took off a more obvious format. Even though, uh, even though the signal were still coming from the 90s during the Chechen wars, for example, and their processing in a cultural and political format. 2008 and the uh, war in Georgia, the first external act of Russian aggression in post-Soviet space and the triumph of the format of hybrid imperialism. But until 2020, 2020 the dis uh, discussion of post-colonial strategy in post-Soviet space was limited to a national format and uh, an expression of traumatic experience and unreflective understanding of the past. Uh, even Russia's aggression, uh, Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine in 2014 uh, has been academically reconsidered as a political uh, event rather than a procedural one. But for example, within Ukraine itself, postcolonial understanding has stuck to national paradigms and uh, detachment from the question of working with both colonial and postcolonial community formats. Uh, to some extent, this approach justifies itself after the outbreak of full-scale war, but a complete and absolute victory of Ukraine military and politically is necessary for its fixation as a dominant narrative. Uh, okay, go back in 2020 and try to uh, assess what happened from the perspective, from the post-colonial perspective of single cases and general post-Soviet understanding. Uh, the first case is uh, Belarus. Uh, a state that, unlike, for example, Ukraine, did not emerge from Soviet autocracy. Uh, the postcolonial optics regarding Belarus is quite clear. 
The Soviet mid-level nomenclature, which came to power based on the Soviet symbolic capital, was synchronous with the society for a long time. Uh, the main uh, dichotomy with, uh, which, uh, on which the ideological model of power was built uh, is old Soviet is good, uh, new nationalist equal Western is bad. Uh, the, first, uh, the first sign of uh, asynchrony, uh, asynchrony uh, between society and power began to appear in 20, uh, 2006 when the post-Soviet generation, which was the main driving force of the protest of 2006, grew up and in 2020 as a basis of the Belarusian middle class took an active part in the protest of 2020. After 2006, a uh, so-called plural identity developed in Belarus as a part of post-colonial society asynchronous with the power. On the one hand, it was politically unsuccessful national project, uh, which was mainly concentrated in Minsk and large cities. On the other hand, it is a post-Soviet behavioral opportunism fueled by the authorities, which continued to develop uh, until, until the beginning of 21st century. The third option provides for a hybrid statement of identity, which can manifest itself in various combinations. The political crisis of 2020, uh, which grew up uh, of already <clears throat> broad asynchronic pandemic and new political opposition elites, activate all dormant and active formats of identity. One of the main principles of uh, representation Oh, oh. Uh, one of the main pr uh, principles of re representation and consequent fixation of diverse traces of identity was the autonomous and simultaneous transition of individuals from the objective to the subject subjective level. For the authorities, this uh, was collapse of the ideological construct of the modern post-Soviet identity, which they had built while uh, in power for 26 years. Their aggressive policy is therefore understandable as, a, as its complete transition to subordinate position within the framework of colonial project of Russia. So the main results of uh, 2020 protests for a, a post-colonial condition of Belarus, the representation of multiple identities and asynchronous relation with the power, the appearance of new political elites uh, which hybridized with the old national elites, the new illiberal non-national project of elites has so far choked in the ideological failure because it does not meet the demands of plural forms of social identity. <coughs> the large uh, migration flow abroad, uh, uh, flow abroad, especially to the neighboring countries of European Union, uh, which can be interpreted as a kind of civilization choice of, uh, of the young middle class. The Russian colonial project in the context of Belarus, especially after February 24, has lost its position as an attractive center for Belarusian, uh, Belarusian periphery. Uh, but, on the other hand, the protests of 2020 exposed only political non-acceptance when the cultural acceptance of Russia uh, remains at high level in society expect, understandably, for the national paradigm which still is ghettoized for. Uh, the second case is uh, uh, Kazakhstan. Also, politically, we can observe many similarities with the uh, Belarusian case. Uh, still, the autocratic model of Kazakhstan is more based on the post-colonial alienation of the colonial experience. In contrast of, uh, to the East European example of, uh, example of Belarus, the ideological foundation of Nazarbayev's Kazakhstan was built on the partial alienation of the colonial presence. It is enough to remember at least the recent changes in law on languages and education significantly expanding the opportunities of the Kazakh language and the gradual education, reduction of Russian education in the public and business space. It should be noted that the strategies of colonial subordination in the situation of Kazakhstan and whole Central Asia region uh, themselves were remarkably different from the, uh, uh, from the uh, East European civilization concept of Russian colonialism. The main distinguishing feature was the Orientalism based intensive colonized of the territories of current Kazakhstan from the time of Russian Empire. Oriental colonialism became the layer of power and uh, in the legal and ideological sense uh, on which the Soviet autocracy in Kazakhstan after 1991 gradually accept nationalism as a strategy of the post-colonial existence. Kazakhstan is a country uh, of classical colonization. 
So the power itself was and is interested in reorganization of identity space. This, this differs from Belarus, uh, where the national is interpreted uh, by the authorities as an ideological counterbalance, like you know, bad. Uh, the political crisis in uh, Kazakhstan in 2020 can be interpreted less as a desire of society or to uh, subjectivize its identity. The protests had clear political and economic, economic overtones. The struggle between uh, reorganized power by, led by President Takayev and all the apparatus of uh, President Nazarbayev. A significant element of the con confrontation was was the intervention of the uh, collective security treaty uh, organization uh, led by Russia. After the resolution of this bloody crisis in early 2022, uh, the political power continued a systematic alienation from the colonizer at the legislative and diplomatic level. For the society, the political struggle turned out to be a obviously tragic event. Protests in Kazakhstan in 20, 2022 uh, can be interpreted as an attempt to break the post-colonial deadlock in political terms, but without a clear alternative agenda. It should be noted that the strategy uh, of gradual alienation of the colonial realized by Kazakh authorities will be, will be, would not be possible without a clear linkage in economic and political sense to an alternative center, which is China. It can be assumed that the identity strategies in Kazakhstan will be closely linked to the policy of the authorities under the China, Chinese protectorate. In the public discourse, alienation is perceived as a natural process, but for the authorities, it's key important in, in the sense of creating loyal pro-Kazakh stru structures of administration and nomenclature. It should be also considered that, the, that a bet on China can lead to the opposite effect and colonization not from the north, but from the east. And this model of assimilation and colonization is much more tougher than Russian model. The last and most obvious case is Ukraine. Uh, clearly, it's very difficult to consider this example in detail within the framework of this presentation. Uh, still, the main uh, this is seem rather obvious. Russian aggression in Ukraine completes, in fact, belated anti-colonial conflict. If uh, if the classical scheme of post-colonial emancipation loops from the creation of anti-colonial elites and the further anti-colonial struggle, followed uh, by the colonial stage. Uh, uh, and transition to post-colonial condition. Uh, the Ukrainian post-Soviet case go, goes uh, in the opposite direction. The only uh, exception may be that anti-colonial elites fixed power in their hands in the country on the way of Russian aggression that began back in 2014. Also, the first and important evolution of 2004 showed their consistency uh, in the domestic political market, the final elimination of pro-colonial elites took place in 2014. Ukrainian identity until 2022 was a composite of multiple uh, layers of the nation, uh, with a national dominant character. Uh, this was supported by local political elites as well as uh, democratization of state institution after 2014, even despite the uh, pervasive threat from Russia. Nationalism as a, uh, nationalism as a post-colonial strategy was perceived to varying degrees and as a dominant within society. Also, uh, it should be said that uh, cultural pluralism, like in Belarusian case, was also present in Ukrainian society. For example, loyalty to, to the colonizer culturally and politically, which uh, conditioned uh, the existence of clearly pro-Russian uh, elites, uh, the national pro-European model with, uh, with the Russian language, the combination of three components of post-Soviet a model of uh, identity, global, national, without or with language, and uh, local uh, post-Soviet. The Ukrainian post-colonial model uh, has developed um, quite successfully. In some points, such as uh, political model uh, or cultural influence, uh, it was possible to achieve following the term terminology of uh, Chakrabarti, uh, the so-called effect of provincialization of the colonizer. Naturally, the colonial apologetics of uh, contemporary Russian authorities could not accept such a development of still recently fully colonized society. The activation of a colonial narrative of a common root of 
brotherly people, which also characteristic in Belarusian case, occurred not only uh, from the reactionary policy of the powers that be, but also from from the liberal stratum uh, in Russia, just, and of course, with a different ideological background. The war that has been going since February has marked a significant shift toward a rather justified anti-colonial nationalism. Nationalism is a meta-discourse that swallows up and, or eliminates all other narratives that concern the community. Therefore, uh, therefore, plurality of identity, like in Belarusian example, turn out uh, uh, to be a completely subordinate to the national dominant. The bipolar, uh, bipolar uh, cultural struggle, like the real one on the fronts, had swallowed up all possible neutral forms of identity. My opinion on this matter is that uh, at this stage, anti-colonial nationalism is justified, uh, but strategies of exit from it should be, uh, should be considered in the elites as well as in society. A scenario of further provincialization of colonizer is possible under either outcome of the war. It is possible to counterbalance the neoliberal European discourse, which is one way or another is taking shape in Ukraine because of accelerated processes of integration with the European Union. But the key point will be uh, the ability to transition painlessly and timely to a stage of anti-colonial nationalism for a speedy conclusion of post-colonial existence in Ukraine. Then there is a possible scenario in which the post-colonial society could become uh, the dominant one in the region, replacing the old colonizer. What are the main conclusions? Uh, we have seen three unique but uh, similar cases, uh, mainly to constant subjection on the part of the former colonizer, the structures of identities, and the partly similar behavior of, of uh, elites. The uniqueness of each is that in many respects strategies of post-colonial condition are determined at different level. In Belarus, it is, uh, it's done by politically unfree society in Kazakhstan, uh, in Kazakhstan power and partly politically unfree society, and uh, in Ukraine, both authorities and, and society. After 2020, the anachronistic colonialism and imperialism of Russia elites, elites in society also manifest itself and in 2020, 2022 has so far reached its peak. Uh, 2020 activate obvious categories uh, in, uh, in uh, academic discourse too, such as uh, imperialism, post-colonialism, decolonization. Obvious because it has been going on for more, uh, more than 30 years, but only now is the moment of incorporating these terms into common discourse. Uh, on the other hand, the lack of elaboration of postcolonial studies regarding the region, the lack of practical research, and, and the ideologization of concepts are main barriers to the research use of postcolonial theory within the post Soviet communities. The core literature is essayistic and uh, publication driven, and the uh, academic narrative is stuck in numerous reconfiguration of the theoretical background. The time has come to, to do a uh, empirical research within theory, but the main challenge will be, uh, will be to avoid the politicization and ideologization uh, of research, which now seems to be a very difficult task for the academic and, and uh, intellectual environment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have three uh, different papers with different approaches, visualization, uh, language of persuasion, a sort of field studies uh, following people's voices, and uh, well, systemic approach. Um, and uh, I hope that our technicians will help us to join, uh, join Miko Aryabchuk who is our last speaker, uh, Mikola, yes. Uh, Mikola Ryabchuk, National Academy of Science of Ukraine, University of Warsaw, and uh, Sev, uh, who will speak about making the nations out of the empire, the post-Soviet experience. Uh, professor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for introduction and for inviting me here. And of course, I apologize for 
uh, for being uh, online, even though I, I would prefer to speak uh, offline to, to be with you. Uh, things happen, alas. Um, probably uh, my topic was formulated too broadly. Uh, so, of course, I, I need to specify that I'm not going to speak about um, uh, imperialism at all. Uh, it's a very broad topic. Uh, there are a lot, there's a whole library of books, and uh, I, I can uh, contribute little to that, uh, including, by the way, uh, very, very good uh, works by um, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian-American historian Alexander Botev, who published uh, Revolutions, Nas Nations and Empires, uh, translated into Ukrainian, and who contributed to numerous uh, collections. Uh, probably one of the best is by, uh, edited by Mark uh, von Hagen, After Empires. Uh, so uh, here I just accept uh, common uh, common wisdom, uh, common uh, definition of empire as a political unit which is made up of uh, several uh, territories and, and peoples, which are quote, usually created by conquest and divided between a dominant center and subordinate peripheries. Uh, I, I focus primarily, of course, on the Soviet, on Russian and Soviet empire and. Uh, uh, surely uh, post-Soviet developments, which are primary concern because we encounter this problem of uh, decolonization. Uh, now, today's uh, war is largely anti-colonial war. It's uh, um, uh, national liberation war, which was postponed in 1991, which was never completed. Uh, but now we have uh, to encounter this problem. We have to finalize the business of 1990, unfinished business of 1991, alas. Uh, because neither Russia was uh, imperialized nor Ukraine was uh, fully and properly uh, de-Sovietized, uh, decolonized. So it's uh, unfinished business, yes. Uh, so uh, my uh, main question, so, so to say research question, is why, um, why most post-Soviet elites uh, accepted more or less successfully the uh, idea of gradual nationalization of their fiefdoms they inherited from the Soviet Union, but with some exceptions, specifically very interesting exception of Belarus, and different case, but also interesting case of, of Russia or of Russian Federation. Um, sure, uh, uh, Russia, Russia, uh, Russian Soviet Union was not considered as empire, and if you take a look at the uh, bibliography before 1991, there are just a few books uh, in the Library of Congress which, were, which contains this uh, name empire applied to the Soviet Union. It was rather very unusual to, to label Soviet Union as an empire. Uh, and whoever tried to, de uh, to do this was considered as a sort of, of maverick of uh, somebody you know, of, 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 of the field. Um, and today is rather common wisdom. We, we recognize as yes, it's empire. It's not, uh, it's not empire. It was not empire like, uh, like overseas empires. Um, it was uh, by uh, of uh, this uh, territory uh, um, with con contiguous territories like uh, uh, Austro uh, Austrian uh, Habsburgian or Ottoman Empire and it had a very serious disadvantage because um, uh, unlike overseas empires which uh, developed nations uh, on the main territory, on the mainland territory, at good efforts to, to maintain colonies uh, overseas and to, to impose different, uh, different rules and different rights uh, upon their subjects and citizens, to actually to separate citizens and subjects. Um, uh, this, you know, uh, continental empires, this con con on contiguous territories, they um, had this mixture and they could, they, they never separated uh, citizens from subjects. They, they, they had the same restrictions, the civil, restrictions of civil rights and uh, all these limitations, um, both within this, you know, uh, colonies, uh, colonies, outskirts, and in the center, which, of course, pre precluded uh, democratic development, precluded uh, liberalization of the center. This was a very, very uh, dramatic, uh, very tragic leg legacy, I would say. Uh, so, um, uh, um, the basic idea is that uh, Russian Russian Empire and eventually Soviet Empire completed some uh, fundamental mistakes because they included territories which uh, by that time had already uh, had uh, developed national identity. Usually empires uh, fall out because of some external challenges, uh, very serious strikes, 
and and or because of uh, internal challenges from uh, nationalism, uh, local, regional uh, nationalism, which actually was very weak in the Russian Empire and in the Soviet Empire, basically, except for some territories which were mistakenly included, incorporated into the Russian Empire. Russia, of course, uh, it's, it's not my idea, it's Roman Spurluk's idea, probably following uh, Richard Pipes, um, who argued that uh, Russian Empire completed fatal mistake when uh, partitioned Poland and took this part, piece of Poland, which was already had already developed national consciousness, national identity, modern national identity, uh, and it was absolutely destructive for the empire. For because empire actually requires some pre-modern uh, identity, loyalty primarily to the to the Tsar, to the leader, to the ruler. Um, and uh, national, any national identity which implies some idea of citizenship and idea of rights and, and so on, so, of course, it's destructive. It's fundamentally uh, ruinous for, for, for the empire. So Poland plays, plays this role. Uh, Soviets, unfortunately, they followed this mistake because they, no, they were smart enough to recognize uh, independence of the Baltic, uh, Baltic nations, but still they, you know, they incorporated eventually uh, them into Soviet Union and also Western Ukraine, which also managed to develop this modern um, uh, national identity, because otherwise we can speculate, we can argue that probably the process of assimilation was could be could have been successful all this um, uh, all this marginal uh, groups all this um, ethnic outskirts could be probably assimilated uh, at the mass level or uh, the elites could be um, incorporated actually as we as we noticed how this uh, coexistence uh, at different levels can uh, happen in uh, Dagestan. It's a very, very good uh, case study, um, which shows how how they how can be co-opted this local elite, and they can can they peacefully coexist uh, without any threat for the empire. It's absolutely a very very good cohabitants, uh, so to say. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, Soviets uh, Soviets uh, made these mistakes and incorporated some territories which were absolutely subversive uh, for the empires, and it's. Uh, so any any liberalization inevitably would provoke uh, some unrest in this specifically in these territories in these regions uh, it, it did happen of course uh, in the Baltic republics and in uh, first of all in western Ukraine but also of course in Kiev um, uh, where, where this uh, ethnic ferment uh, worked and uh, ultimately it of course led to, to, to the collapse of the Soviet Union, even though if you remember in, uh, in March 1991, a majority of Ukrainians uh, voted, uh, did not support the idea of, uh, of secession, yes, because they supported Gorbachev's pr proposal for renewed federation, 70% of the people, which means that nationalism was weak in Ukraine, basically, except for some, for some regions, for some urban centers, it was basically, basically very weak. Uh, people, uh, they, all the time they had some sort of uh, ethnic, uh, Patri local patriotism, uh, unquestionably, throughout the 19th century, even in the darkest time, times of uh, Russification uh, and, and, uh, and the Tsars and, and the Bolsheviks, they, they, ha they had this feeling of local patriotism. Uh, otherwise, would, would, they would have not supported um, uh, independence in, in, in December in 1991. But it was as a conformist approach. In March, uh, the, in March 1991, the dominant, uh, the dominant intention of the ruling elite was to, to, uh, to remain within the Soviet Union. So people followed this, this way. They supported the authorities. Uh, in 1991, the authorities changed their intentions, they changed mood, and people so again supported authorities. So it was uh, rather conformist voting than some sort of national uh, uh, nationalistic resistance, uh, upheaval, etc. Uh, nonetheless, uh, local elite opportunistically use this. Uh, use, they use this uh, chance everywhere in Ukraine as well as Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Even those societies were heavily Russified there. At least were. 100% Russified, you know. Um, nonetheless, they opted for some sort of uh, nation building. Uh, they needed some sort of nation. They had to create this nation uh, from, from, from just from population, uh, lo local territorial population. And they embarked, uh, engaged in this process of very gradual, very slow, incoherent, inconsequent, uh, inconsequent, inconsequent 
uh, nation building. It's another paradox, and I believe Ukraine is very, very good, very interesting case. Not only Ukraine, probably Kazakhstan as well, but Ukraine is particularly interesting because uh, uh, there was no change of elite in Ukraine, basically. You know, the same communist elite, which was 100% Russified, inherited a huge uh, state, huge republic. Uh, but agreed uh, with uh, their uh, opponents, national democratic opposition, which was uh, which was uh, weak but still significant, un unlike in Belarus, by the way, and probably it might, might be one of the differences um, between the two states. They um, made some concessions to this democratic uh, opposition, uh, modest uh, nationalistic opposition. They gave them some, them some positions, some instruments to pers uh, pursue this process of uh, mild Ukrainization, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Culture. So they're very good, very good concessions because uh, ruling elite inherited more important fields like you know uh, banks and enterprises and all this. Um, uh, Things for privatization. It's a very good deal uh, because they have some some stuff which was not profitable, like cultural education. But nonetheless, they agreed with this, you know, with this um, uh, process of nation building. And uh, within 10, 20 years, basically, uh, situation began to change. And uh, by uh, by uh, 2012, for example, uh, already majority of Ukrainians were. Uh, pro-Western oriented, as opinion surveys um, uh, indicated that you, most Ukrainians prefer uh, their uh, all national identity over local identity. It was very significant change by uh, 20, uh, 2012. And also they uh, prefer uh, Western orientation over uh, East European, uh, East uh, Eurasian, some, so to say, uh, unif unification or integration. Uh, significant uh, shift which occurred actually before the Euromaidan, before uh, 2014, uh, 13, which, which is also very, uh, very in, uh, interesting because we can speculate now whether Euromaidan uh, provoked some processes or was a result of some, some uh, processes which uh, gradually matured and evolved in, in Ukrainian society. Nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, uh, we uh, observe very interesting uh, case uh, in Ukraine. How um, and probably typical case uh, when you know when uh, any elite which inherited such you know big state and uh, um, uh, has ambition to to uh, not to own it but also to legitimize this ownership and engage in in this uh, process of. Uh, of nation building, which also includes some sort of of uh, yes, so indigenization. Um, the same actually happened in 1920s, which was also a very interesting process when Bolsheviks had to, to make some concessions to uh, to, uh, to to ethnics. Uh, actually, they, they they won because of this. They because Denikin did not want to do this. He he was uh, stupid enough. Both people were much smarter, and they won some part of of uh, ethnics. Uh, it brought them to their uh, side. Uh, but but again, um, they also still controlled even. Despite these concessions, they, they controlled main structures like party and KGB. It was absolutely. It never was uh, decentralized. There was no devolution. So. The, the, uh, so, uh, well, um, Belarus, I believe, was a different case and rather exceptional case. And um, my argument is that, uh, unfortunately, both in Belarus and um, in Russia, uh, uh, a kind of this pre-modern uh, imperial quasi-religious identity survived largely because it was, um, uh, it was um, uh, fused with... Uh, this orthodoxy. It doesn't mean that people are believers, that they are you know, true Christians and committed Christians, but you know, this kind of East Slavonic identity was forged in the, since 18th century in a way that it fused uh, religious matters, religious identity uh, with uh, confessional identity with uh, some sort of ethnicity and state, state uh, belonging. And uh, th this created very dangerous, very, uh, very uh, anachronistic, anachronistic mixture, I believe, because it was also it based uh, the, this uh, forged identity uh, upon very archaic values uh, brought from orthodoxy. 
And this quasi-religious identity, this identification, this imagined community of Eastern Slavs, of uh, Orthodoxes, uh, uh, remained, uh, remained un unchallenged, both in Russia and to large extent, I would say, in Belarus. Uh, in Ukraine also, but Ukrainians were more successful in emancipation from this uh, imagined community. Mm, uh, Russians not, and Belarusians also, unfortunately, not. And uh, I, I believe that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very harmful for both nations because it precludes their uh, effective modernization. You cannot, you cannot modernize a country unless uh, identity of the people is based on some pre-modern values. Uh, essentially related to this uh, medieval version of uh, Orthodox Christianity. Actually, what we observe today in Russia, and it's uh, implicated also, projected uh, upon Belarus. So uh, we have um, big challenges now in both, uh, in both uh, this, in all these uh, three Slavonic uh, republics, uh, different challenges, but they are actually, all of them are related to um, uh, relics of uh, imperial identity, uh, uh, related to emancipation from, from, from the empire and from imperial identity. As I mentioned already, Ukraine is much more successful in this process of emancipation. I probably it's, uh, get rid already of uh, all this. Uh, of these relics, uh, but still, it also the remain problem of mental mental emancipation, uh, because uh, as you know, empire is uh, something uh, some structure which uh, usurps the power to speak on behalf of uh, the colonies of the subjugated nations. Um, and um, to make them invisible and and, uh, and, and mute. So uh, the problem today is that uh, imperial knowledge, so-called imperial knowledge, persists. It, it does exist. It's, it became international knowledge uh, within the past centuries. Uh, knowledge which is established in, in Western academia, we, in pop culture, everywhere. It became common knowledge. And it's very difficult to challenge. And unfortunately, this imperial knowledge largely facil facilitates today's Russian behavior, Russian aggression, and, and so on. So I believe it's, it's a very big challenge for both Ukrainians, but also for international community, for academics, to, to challenge, to decolonize uh, Western universities, Western media, Western uh, consciousness, uh, so to say. But also the same challenge is do domestic challenge. We also have this problem in Ukraine because uh, millions and millions of Ukrainians uh, Within centuries, they internalized this imperial knowledge. Many of them accepted this, um, uh, this, this Russian superiority, uh, Russian singularity as, as the only, actually, it was the only history we, we, we studied in schools. It was the only culture, only literature we studied in schools, uh, or top, uh, all the other were marginal. And of course, it, it, it occupies disproportionately huge space in our uh, mentality, in our consciousness. So it's also a big challenge to, to, to de deconstruct it and, and, and decolonize. So uh, this one, one, more, one more challenge for all of us. Uh, and uh, I predict we have a lot of problems with this uh, be besides the war and after the war. Uh, but nonetheless, um, to sum up, uh, we, uh, we have to, to, to recognize that uh, empires are um, outdated. Uh, creatures, uh, they uh, could successfully exist in pre-modern world, and they did exist, and probably it was a, probably the best form of political uh, existence at the time, but they, can, they are incompatible with modern world just because there is a modern nationalism which destroys them, which subverts them, undermines them, challenges them, and they have to be either uh, increasingly uh, uh, repressive, as actually we observe it in Russia, or they have to, to collapse, they have to, to fall down, because they are actually in, in, incompatible with modern nationalism, with particularism. They uh, are based on different notion of new universality. They uh, based on the idea of inclusiveness for uh, all these you know, elites, local elites should be included also, incorporated, co-opted into the uh, imperial elite. Uh, while uh, people uh, are at the pre-modern level, at the level of pre-modern uh, 
identity, so they are not citizens, they are subjects. They just have to be loyal. There is, they are not required to be citizens because citizens have different uh, consciousness, different identity, and of course they require different uh, level of freedoms, of rights, which is not in, in the interest of uh, empires. Uh, so, uh, conclusion is, of course, that we uh, enter in hopefully very bright new world, uh, brave new world, uh, but maybe not. So, so that's so much. Uh, okay, um, I feel we we have some time for for questions, so I wouldn't wouldn't continue with all these deliberations. Um, thank you for uh, thank you, my predecessors, for for these presentations. They were extremely interesting, and uh, I'd like to, to to be engaged into discussions, but it's uh, it's uh, not my turn now. Let uh, let the public uh, begin. Well, thank you very much. And I think that this is a good time to start discussion. So anybody who would like to take the floor and ask our distinguished panelists a micro, oh, even two micros are present. Oh, yes, please. Uh, Irina Bajinska, uh, Vasil Stus, Donetsk National University. My question to the first speaker, Anna Novikov. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the Russian propaganda <coughs> uh, tries um, uh, to represent a so-called uh, special military operation in Ukraine as peacekeeping operation, uh, which has uh, two aims at least. The first aim is uh, the liberation of Donbass. The second one is peace enforcement of Ukraine. Uh, what do you think about it from a military propaganda perspective? Very similar question to, to Anna. Yes, of course. Uh, is it the news that ideology uh, somehow goes to, to the export? It's somehow exportable to the country uh, which called Bliska uh, Zagranica, for example? I don't know, B Baltic states or... Uh, or Central Asia states, uh, or, for example, Russian migrants in Europe. It it's goes from, from Russia or staying in the uh, internal, internal market? Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you for the questions. And in regard to the first question, I just wanted to tell that actually um, what I was trying to show and what was interesting for me here, it's uh, not to go into the specific like aims, but to show actually the whole process of dehumanization, which allows later on to like you know to conduct the things which were conducted in Ukraine, you know, by force and by violence. Because once you compare Ukrainians to national socialists, and once you see actually, like, you know, stickers on cars, we are going on Berlin, but actually they're going to Ukraine. And when you all the time compare the Ukrainians to national socialists, it's very actually easy. And we know this already, this historical processes from the history of dehumanization. When you see people not as living people, that's as uh, as they're called in Russian, as you know, it's like in a very humiliating way, Nataki. This means that it's very easy to conduct these operations. And this was actually very interesting uh, for me from this point. And uh, what I wanted to show actually, it's um, the background which was created during the last decade in order to bring people easier to react this way. Because even if people were not entirely agreed during, like, you know, with all the things I was showing later, uh, earlier, etc. Anyway, the whole perception background, which allowed people to receive, perceive all the symbols easier and to perceive all the messages, propaganda messages easier, like, you know, the visual symbols, etc. it's actually what's created, like, you know, the results of these operations in the end. So, yeah, so this was my message. And um, so in regard to your question, if I understood it correctly, I'm not sure. It's actually where all this has a sort of trash national Im impact, yes. Yeah, so first of all, if we're speaking about the whole uh, like phenomenon of uh, this, um, I would say, uh, patriotic performance or like, you know, all this, it's it's not entirely Russian. As I told at the beginning, it's uh, very transnational actually and it exists in simultaneously in many countries. But what's interesting that we have here, um, 
sort of um, certain global um, sort of global features and media, etc. Like you know, all the social media, for instance, which are used and the way you express it, like YouTube channels or like selfies or flash mobs, etc. And then you have channeling the local, um, like you know, the um, the local messages and the local. Uh, like, you know, ideological background. So, for instance, while we have similar uh, phenomenon in uh, Poland, in Ukraine, in Latvia, etc., in many countries, like, you know, it has its uh, its own, like, you know, um, um, propaganda meaning. So, Russia took in, in, into this direction of, uh, like, you know, Putinism and uh, military propaganda. I mean, is this, if I understood correctly, and by the way, there are also transnational influences when you see that some things appear in one country and then they go into other country, for instance, with the folk costumes. It was very interesting to follow some countries like Poland, Ukraine, and uh, in the end, Russia, when they took the same uh, sort of symbol and reinterpreted it. Now, it's, uh, for a question to the Russian, I would say, um, diaspora, if this were the question, actually, agencies, um, Yes and no, because it depends also on the local country reaction for it. As I know in Latvia, it was sometimes really problematic to do it in public. In Berlin, for instance, as I showed it. Um, yes. Uh, so in uh, in Germany, I, I actually came across, but in Germany, it's, again, it's 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 also the question how much the, the, the state supports it, because in, on, um, when Russia supports all the things, it's it's much easier to do it when Germany forbids all the Z signs on the cars, etc., immediately. So it's harder to do it. And then anyway, they find the way they did in Treptow Park. We don't put the Russian symbol; we put the Soviet symbols because then the Berlin police is not really familiar with them or something. Oh, by the way, some of them, for instance, I saw lots of Kazakhstan patriots who were using Kazakh flag to sort of support the Russian patriots and they were opening the flags, I have the pictures, and then the Russians stayed in under Kazakhstan flags and pretended it's Russia or something like this. So it's really interesting how it migrates. Well, thank you. Are uh, other questions? It doesn't work. Yes, please. Oh. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a couple of questions for Anna as well. The first one is, uh, as far as we see, the, the, the red star on the St. George ribbon, uh, it has always been like more or less a left-wing, right-wing, how could I say, a, a parallelism or something. Um, do you think that the traditionalism that you've shown, including on the dresses and these sort of things, and the, the role of the church and so on, pushes to, toward a more traditionally right-wing nationalism for, for the Kremlin, actually. The second question is about uh, the orchestration of these youth movements, uh, because uh, Dugin's movement, U Eurasian movement, is not especially linked, directly linked to the Kremlin, when uh, Yunarmia is actually a, a, a creation of Shoigu. Uh, and we didn't speak about uh, Nashi, for instance, but it might be included in the deal as well. Uh, how spontaneous within the society uh, that endorse this type of you know, military culture or how orchestrated is it by the Kremlin, according to you? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for uh, your questions. Yes, it's very interesting, actually. Um, if I understood it correctly, the first question, it was about the political like meaning of all the Soviet and uh, Red Stars, etc. As far as I could see, when it comes like beyond a certain party ideology, etc., people use all the symbols without even bringing any left special left politics. It's more... Uh, I would say it's more like less uh, political in terms of right and left. Although, for instance, when I saw the uh, like you know the the, the 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 German supporters in Berlin running with the Red Stars, it was clear for me like their political uh, affiliation. But when I see uh, the, the the like you know the the Russian patriots writing running with it, it's rather. Uh, memory of, I would say, the glorious imperial Soviet past when we are the winner people, our people, our grandfathers, and it's rather intergenerational that they are creating sort of a link between themselves and the grandfathers who won the war. So again, now we are winning the war. So it's more, I would say, it's it's not only nostalgia and nostalgia, like in terms of uh, German terms, but it's, uh, I would say it's much more, they are really living it. They're really living, and it's really interesting how it's combined also the fusions from the 19th century it's with the Soviet time, and actually the postmodern, I would say, now reality. So it's so mixed now that it's apart from really being like having like again, I'm speaking about the masses, about like general uh, usual people. It's uh, it's far from there. So it's it, it's very unique what's going on now, and as as, as you indeed mentioned that we have this um, like uh, uh, Eurasian uh, uh, youth, and then we have. 
actually uh, we have the Shoigu uh, young people and yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing because I could follow like in the last couple of years, it's really like at the beginning it was indeed like, yes, a group which has some aim, etc. But now it's became, and especially in the last year and now, especially last spring, so spontaneous, they're just popping like mushrooms after the rain in different, like in different areas and sometimes also in the periphery. It's very interesting. So it's all around. I'm following it and um, sometimes I even don't entirely perceive the idea of it. Like, you know, for instance, the pioneers. Because like when it was on the Red Square in Moscow, they were trying to create a substitutions or something like this, not like 100% pioneers but something new, but then all the, like, you know, even the former republics, but especially in the areas of Russia, they took it seriously. Yes, we again, we're pioneers, again, we go back to, now we learn from our great parents and we take out all the symbols. So they take it really, like, without even sometimes understanding the whole, like, major idea, they just, they just really supporting it without thinking too much, or even this children, uh, kindergartens, again, it was so spontaneous that I think it wasn't even expected how people support it, uh, without even sometimes consulting or understanding. It really comes from below now. Well, thank you. Are uh, other questions, please? Yeah, uh, if you don't mind, I also would like to ask <laughs> Professor uh, Novikov, namely, uh, how does the young generation of Russians perceive the military propaganda in mass culture and the attempts to somehow establish uh, the personality cult of Vladimir Putin. Do they think it's somehow cool or rather corny and somehow cringe-worthy? Thank you in advance for your answer. Yeah, thank you for this question. Well, I cannot tell, uh, like, you know, now in the name of the whole young generation of Russia, of course, but as far as I could follow the dynamics, it started as a told rather as something marginal, sometimes even a, a bit ironical and comic. And, but already them, I warned that it's, 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 it's not so funny like it looks like because in the end it started to be more global and sometimes, like when we're thinking about the theory of Nassim Taleb, like, you know, the anti-fragility with something which becomes a subject, like, you know, of love or something, it actually brings more attention. So it's became more accepted and supported in the end and this is actually when I see that the younger generation um, instead of using social media, like, you know, for, like, we were thinking earlier, yes, for the bigger world, global, they're actually going back. They're saying, yes, we take some trends, indeed, like trends of uh, Berlin, etc., but we are reinterpreting it in our support of, uh, like, you know, of either Putin or the whole, or, of the whole idea. So it becomes then more trend. And when already in 2017, uh, Putin was compared by young, yes, youth organizations as a fashion brand, so it means that actually it's, it gets quite support in different areas. Again, I cannot speak for, of course, for the whole, and there's lots of, but it's enough that there is a big, loud group who supports it in order to create, you know, the snowball effect. Thank you. Well, my question is to Dr. Kaliszewska. Uh, but listening you uh, and imagining uh, Dagestan uh, as a very diverse country with multitude of people are uh, complicated identifications. I would like to ask if there is still a place for a sort of state political identification. After all, we are all Ruski as a citizen of Russian Federation, or this is passed away, this Ruskaya identification. Uh, mm, thank you for this question. Well, no. Uh, no Dagestani would say, like, we are all Ruskies. So there is the strong Dagestani. In the, there, are, there are local identifications, like you could identify as Avar, Dargi, or Tabasaran. And it's, of course, it's, it's very strong, and it has to do with all the clan identifications. It's kind of a complicated picture. But, uh, and then they would, uh, they would identify as Dagestanis, but they would very unlikely identify as... Uh, Ruskia, uh, Russiania, or Ruskia. No, 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 they, they are making a clear distinction. If they go from Dagestan to, let's say, uh, even Astrakhan or Moscow, they would say, I'm going to Russia. So Russia is the part of the country that is outside of the North Caucasus. Well, like, it's hard to tell whether Sochi belongs to Russia. It does. So this is more Dagestan, Chechnya, and Gushetia that are 
that are sort of perceived outside of Russia. There's been a politics to bring it back, and even in the like public narrative, they were saying, oh, you shouldn't say we are going to Russia. But people were saying, anyway, there's this, clo there's this, there's this uh, very strict separation between the, between the two. That's why I was expecting that maybe, you know, if the economy collapses or something bad happens, that there is a potential for some kind of mobilization, but I'm not so sure about it. I'm not, that wouldn't also be too good for the people in there, but that's another thing. That's more of an, um, more of an emotional level, but, um, but no, the, there is a separation, but this uh, money relationship, it's very, it's very strong, and I think it's, and the subsidies, all the subsidies that people receive for child, ch child money, some kind of retirement money, disability money, all the state subsidies, they're actually buying the people in this, in this republic off, honestly. Dali Charikashvili from Young Scientist Program. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your interesting speeches and uh, presentations. They are very important and emotional for me as I am from Georgia and my country is occupied by Russia, 20%. Uh, so uh, I want to ask you about uh, the uh, video which you showed us. So is there is a possible positive scenario, optimistic scenario that Russia can ever become a peaceful country as in the video we saw how uh, children in kindergartens, they are wearing uh, like a soldiers, they are wearing like a toy uh, weapons and uh, they are just growing up with the ideology of uh, like, let's say, glorious history of Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, and they are creating future of Russia. Thank you. Well, this is a very uh, large question, and we got this great opportunity to have two prophets, prophets female and one male, so I give you floor. Please, give your prophecy Will yeah. ever Russia return to its cradle? Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, I'm, I'm a historical and cultural anthropologist. I'm not a predicting and not a prophet, first of all. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm against prophecies because we already have seen that the prophecies don't really work in, a, in many cases, especially on the case of Russia. But uh, what I can see... Um, to be honest, like I, 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 of course, of Russia, what I was showing, it's only some part of the society, and of course, we have parts of the society who are either indifferent or like against, uh, like you know what's going on now. So we have, of course, different uh, different groups, etc. And uh, well, um, I, I cannot tell again like any prediction, but if my it's it's about my personal uh, like you know um, view, I'm a bit pessimistic. Because I think, and here it's again my personal view that we are speaking not only about some uh, social and historical developments, but also group psychology. And there are certain traumas which are returning right now already, like you know, from uh, from several generations, and which are used, like you know, in order to put, like you know, salt on the pains of people and to provoke them. Like for instance, World War II, and we are also speaking about earlier, and you know, it's it's it comes again and again and again, and provokes uh, lots of emotions. So I think here. Um, What's going on right now? It's it, it's it's really 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 emotional, and it's also the propaganda used all the time to like you know to raise uh, or mobilize all this. Uh, well, yesterday it was uh, like you know speaking about a lot about uh, mobilization etc. And uh, it's it's really used on the group psychology. And if we're speaking about some other populations around Russia, there are also lots of traumas. So it, I to be honest, like myself. Well, I cannot predict what's going on in 100 years. Maybe we get an uh, atom bomb in like, you know, in a year, and uh, that's all, so there is nothing. But I would love to finish with a very optimistic note, but I personally can't, sorry. <laughs> well, no. Um, I don't want to sound too pessimistic. Well, I was always hoping for it. I was always perceived like in my institutes, like, oh, you're being, you know, uh, I always hated the Polish, the, the, the way the Polish people are anti-Russian, but now I'm like, well, whatever. So, uh, no, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not optimistic. I do have some hope that uh, if the economy goes down, the people in the outskirts that do not buy into this propaganda so much that 
that they may rebel at some point, but uh, uh, not anytime soon. And if that would be for good or for bad, I would. I, I also. I, I. I also can't say that. So. So no. I had a lot of hopes for Russia to modernize and to be kind of an okay country. It was getting there at some point, but. But now I think they have destroyed it all. Yeah. I'm, I'm not optimistic. Sorry. Yeah, my opinion is negative and pessimistic too. Uh, I think that in Russia there is no possibilities to change in politically and intellectual sense. I think that it's uh, possible only in the opposite direction from the post-Soviet societies. When post-Soviet societies will decide to decolonize or uh, working with this new kind of strategy to adopted, for example, a colonial background, accepted colonial background and adopted this in a new identity forms, that is possible in opposite direction, but not from Russia. It's, yeah. it's very sad, but it's probably true. Thank you. I agree. Well, it's a time to, to finish our, our very fruitful session. Thank you very much indeed for all speakers present here and Mikola Ryabchuk who was as well. And uh, well, thank you very much. Well, I would like to thank you all audience for uh, listening uh, and for asking the questions. And a little bit off of record, I would like to put forward an optimistic statement. Uh, out of record, of course, and my inspiration came from Anton. Uh, recently, I've heard that Kingdom of Belgium had returned golden tooth of Patrice Lumumba, who had been murdered by some people among them, they were some official policemen of Kingdom of Belgium. So uh, even <clears throat> Kingdom of Belgium refused to recognize this crime 40 years or even more. So, but finally, they uh, gave back a tooth, golden one. So uh, this is my optimism, but please, uh, understand that as an off-record statement inspired by post-colonial analysis given uh, to us by Anton Saifuayev. Uh, this, I think we can close. Seance élevée. Merci beaucoup.